Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Turn in there with me. And I'm still uh, celebrating what God spoke to us through the power of his word this morning. Also, Sidney Barlow was baptized at the end of service this morning. Many of you had already left, but we had a baptism. So thankful she was buried in the name of... Okay, so it's time. Time to preach. Not time to disengage. How many are hearers of the word, but not just hearers, doers as well? Anybody in the room? We might as well have church, huh? Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. John the Baptist speaking. He said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. You know, we, th we think of the Holy Ghost, and we think, well, the gifts of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, temperance. It just makes us sound so nice. So I'm grateful that God puts all those nice things in our lives so we can be nice. I'm glad when we go through the Tim Hortons drive through and they say, I'm sorry, we were closed, we had a power outage. And I really want my coffee that I can smile and say, that's okay, I'll just drive across town. Because the Holy Spirit makes us nice. That happened this afternoon. But God also along with it said, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And I've just learned there's something a little bit unpredictable about fire. You can't tell where it's going to go. You can't tell what it's going to consume. You can't tell everything that's just going to kind of get lit up by it. But something happens when the Holy Ghost couples itself with fire in our lives. I'm not saying we don't get nice, but I'm saying something terrific happens. Something monumental happens. Something unforgettable happens. that allows us to go beyond just being nice. Would you pray a prayer with me? Father, it's simple tonight. I thank you for the power of your word, and I thank you for what we've already heard today. But Father, in this service, these people tonight, Lord, I'm trembling under the power of the Holy Ghost right now. I'm praying that you would baptize us with the Holy Ghost and with fire tonight. God, don't leave out half the equation in our lives. God, don't leave us halfway between where you want us to be and what we are. Father, I'm asking tonight that you would let Holy Ghost unction operate in this room. I'm praying that Holy Ghost power would sweep from vessel to vessel, heart to heart, and life to life. Father, we're asking Jesus that the power of Holy Ghost and fire would rest on every heart and on every life and that we would leave different than the way that we came. And we pray it. In the incomparable name of Jesus. And would someone say amen one more time tonight? Oh, just that was pretty good, but one more time. Would you count to three? One, two, three, and say it. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I, I do feel the power of God's spirit at work in this room right now. You may never have asked yourself this question, so let me ask it for you. What happens when a dog interrupts a concert? Now, we've had pizza delivery guys interrupt church services before, but I think we can honestly say that we haven't had a dog interrupt a concert. To answer that, come with me to a spring night in Lawrence, Kansas. Take your seat in Hoke Auditorium and behold Leipzig Gwandhaus Orchestra, the oldest continuing op operating orchestra in the world. The greatest composers and conductors in history have operated this orchestra. They've directed they have been uh, playing since the days of Beethoven. Many of the musicians have been replaced. You'll be glad to know that. But you can watch as stately dressed Europeans take their seat on the stage. You listen as professionals carefully tune their instruments. The percussionist put her ear to the kettle drum. The violinist plucks the nylon string. The clarinet player tightens the reed. And you sit a bit straighter as the lights dim and the tuning stops and the music is about to begin. 
The conductor, dressed in tails, strides onto the stage, springs onto the podium, and gestures for the orchestra to rise. You and 2,000 others applaud. The musicians take their seats, the maestro takes his position, and the audience holds its breath. There is a second of silence between lightning and thunder, and there is a second of silence between the raising of the baton and the explosion of music. But when it falls, the heavens open, and you are delightfully drenched in the downpour of Beethoven's Third Symphony. Such was the power of that spring night in Lawrence, Kansas, that hot spring night in Lawrence, Kansas. I mentioned the temperature so you'll understand why the doors were open. It was hot. Everyone say it's hot. Uh, if you just looked up like me right now, you've seen 16 fans in motion. I'll just tell you that the air conditioner has been broke for three days. Seriously. I did jumpstart it with a stick this afternoon. Don't ask me how. We'll talk later. It was hot. It's a historic building, so it was not air conditioned, much like this one right now. Combine bright stage lights with formal dress and furious music, and the result is a heated orchestra. Outside doors on each side of the stage were left open in case of a breeze, and enter on stage right the dog. A brown, generic Kansas dog. Not a mean dog, not a mad dog, just a plain old dog. He passes between the double basses and makes his way through the second violins into the cellos. And his tail wags and beat with the music. And as the dog passes between the players, they look at him, look at each other, and continue with the next measure of music. The dog takes, takes a liking to a certain cello, and perhaps it was the lateral passing of the bow. Maybe it was the eye-level view of the strings. Whatever it was, it caught the dog's attention, and he stopped, and he watched. The cellist wasn't sure what to do. He'd never played before a canine audience, and music stools don't teach you what dog slobber might do to the lacquer of a 16th century Garnelli cello. But the dog needed nothing but watch for a moment and then move on. Had he passed through the orchestra, the music might have continued. Had he made his way across the stage to the motioning hands of the stage hand, the audience might never have noticed. But he didn't leave. He stayed. At home in the splendor, roaming through the meadow of music, he visited the woodwinds, turned his head at the trumpets, stepped in between the flutists and stopped by the side of the conductor. And Beethoven's third symphony came undone. The musicians begin laughing. The audience laughed. The dog looked up and the conductor, at the conductor and just panted. The conductor lowered his baton. And the most historic orchestra in the world, one of the most moving pieces ever written, a night wrapped in glory, all was brought to a halt because of one wayward dog. The chuckles ceased as the conductor turned. What fury might erupt? The audience grew quiet as the maestro faced them. What fuse had been lit? The polished German director looked down at the crowd and then looked down at the dog and looked back to the people, raised his hands in a universal gesture and what do you do when a dog interrupts the orchestra? Everybody laughed. He stepped off the podium, scratched the dog behind the ears. The tail wagged again. The maestro spoke to the dog. He spoke in German, but the dog seemed to understand. The two visited for a few seconds before the maestro took his new friend by the collar and with his new job led him off the stage. And you'd have thought that the dog was Pavarotti by the way that people applauded. The conductor returned and the music once again began and Beethoven seemed none the worse for the wear by the whole experience. And you say, well, why are you telling us that story tonight? Well, for one, it's hot. <laughs> for two, I don't know if we should open the doors because for good or for ill, our parking lot has become Marysville's dog walking sanctuary. For three, I think it's because so often we are that dog. We come into God's presence, and we really don't have a clue. I'm not being negative tonight. I mean, if we only knew exactly what was happening behind the scenes, if we ever truly saw how God was orchestrating everything in motion, in action, 
with every single song. And sometimes we come in and we are completely oblivious. We find ourselves our favorite seat and we sit down and, and our tail wags a little bit with the music. We're excited to be in the house of God. But if we could only ever really see what's happening behind the scenes, the work that God is doing in hearts, the work that God is doing in lives, how God is ministering to a need that somebody has physically, how God is ministering to a need that somebody has emotionally, how God is ministering to a need that somebody has spiritually. And, and sometimes we're just, we're just blissfully unaware of what God is actively doing in the middle of this room tonight. Can I let you know that the Holy Ghost has so much power that when we begin to unpack it, when we begin just to ask God to let us see a vision of it, we can barely understand it. That's the power that God has. That's how, that, that's how intricate his working is. That's how amazing he moves amongst us. We just really don't get it. We, we try and open our minds to it. We get in the pulpit at prayer time. We say, we really don't understand what can happen through the power of prayer. We happen to pray at prayer time, and, and we just trust that God's moving. But if we could really see the angelic hosts that are waiting just to be beckoned by God's hand because we prayed in Jesus' name and believe that God was on the move, and we believe that God was acting. And if we just really understood what was happening while we were singing, that the oil of the Spirit of God was pouring into lives and touching hearts I think maybe we come into the presence of God with just a little bit more attention sometimes I think sometimes if we truly understand how God could work we'd approach this place a little bit differently we come in with a higher intention. We come in with a higher level of focus. We come in saying, come on, let's have a move of God tonight. Come on, let's let God work. I know it's warm, but it really doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Just let God move. Just let him work. If we could truly understand how God is working behind the scenes. You know, we can't afford to have this spirit thing working for us a little bit here and there, and a little bit in our lives, a little bit in our homes, a little bit in our church. We have got to have the Holy Ghost and fire at work in our lives. Every service, every day, everything that we do, if we just ask God to work in a special way, if we ask God to work in a powerful way, God will do the work. We have a generation that does seek a sign. You know that. We've got a generation that, you know, it's in Matthew 16 that Jesus said a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. But we are living in a, a generation like that. We are living in a wicked generation, and we are living in an adulterous generation, and they're looking for a sign. And Jesus said no sign is going to be given it except the sign of John the Baptist. Repent. That's the sign that's going to be given to it. But I think in the middle of that, we have to be careful that we don't cater to the world. Because the world is seeking something that's novel and seeking, seeking something that will tickle a fancy, something that will just kind of just kind of tweak their interests a little bit, kind of make their face turn our way. And that's not really what we're after. I'm after for God to do something that gets the attention of the world. It happened in Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts chapter 19. I'm looking for something like that, but I don't want to get the cart before the horse. I don't want to get this thing turned around and, and us have activity that gets people's attention that's outside of God's purpose and God's plan. What we do desire and what we do long after is that the Holy Ghost would move with power and that the Holy Ghost would move with authority and something would happen in our midst so that God's presence gets acknowledged and God's power shows up and the world cannot ignore something like that. The world can't ignore something like that. We don't line up in society next to the bearded lady and the six-finger giant. This isn't a carnival. This is God's church. We aren't magicians. We are people of the name. We are God's church. This isn't a Mount Carmel competition. Let's see whose God answers by fire. We are the church. This is an apostolic lifestyle that yields apostolic product. And I tell you what, if we get that in order, we will see the world show up, show up, show up to see God do the work that only God can do. This has got to be genuine apostolic work and moving of God. This has got to be the gifts of the Spirit in operation. This has to be the fruit of the Spirit growing in the lives of believers that people take note of who you are. People take note of it. 
It does happen through a place of repentance. And I'm asking tonight, as we are in that matchless presence of God, that we would search our heart, that we would search our life, that we would ask God, God, is there anything that's not right in me? Is there anything that would hinder the moving of your spirit? Is there anything that would arrest the flow of the power of God? Is there anything that would keep my life from being set on fire? Is there anything? Is there anything that i got to work on? Is there anything that i got to remove? Is there anything that I need to repent of? Because repentance opens the door for all of this to happen in our lives. Repentance is the power that opens the door for the Spirit to do the work that it wants to do. That's why we, had, we did it. We did it last Sunday. It was wonderful. I watched as Brother Gleason opened that up in this service. And we began to repent. And we began to pray that God would forgive us for sin. That God would begin to forgive us for wrongdoing. That God would begin to forgive us for attitudes that would separate us from his plan and his purpose. And when we, we begin to repent and we ask God to turn us around and turn our lives around, we put ourselves in position to be set on fire by God. In the wonder of it all, we have to be careful that we don't get this thing turned around. But this begins in a place of repentance, in a place where our heart gets right with God. We have to be careful that we aren't seeking the power of God more than the God of power. That's the wonder of Acts chapter 1. They were willing to wait for the comforter. They were willing to wait for the power. He had promised that it would come, but they were willing to wait until it came. Go to Jerusalem and tarry there. You can read about it in the early chapters of Acts. He said, go and tarry there. I want to interrupt your life. I want to interrupt your schedule. I want to interrupt your activity. I want to inconvenience you, is what God was saying. I want to get your attention until the world releases its grip on who and what you are, and you get a grip on what I am and what I can do, is exactly what God was saying to that New Testament church that was birthing in Acts. Jesus was saying, I want to mess up your plan and make sure that this church thing is your priority. I need to get you on track. You may say, I want the spirit, but I don't want all that. I'll be honest with you, neither do I. I like schedule. I like showing up for work. I like leaving too. I like going home. I love my family. I like schedule. I like routine. I think there's power in it. We've talked about it. The calendar has, we can do a lot when we work with the calendar. Pastor preaches calendar for us all the time. As a matter of fact, I, I think recently I've coined that his sixth spiritual gift. He has the gift of calendar. He's trying to transfer it. He's laying hands on me and he's trying to get it in there. I'm resisting. We know that. But there's something that happens when we're willing to let God interrupt our lives. There's something that happens when we're willing to let God and the power of the Spirit do something in us that we can't do ourselves. So we want the Spirit. But I'm asking us, church family tonight, guests that are with us, do you really want the power of God moving in your life? Because I tell you, when he said he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, that wasn't something that was previous uh, dispensation. That wasn't something that was only available in the last dispensation. But that's something that's available in our dispensation. Everyone say right now. That's available to us right now. If we want the Holy Ghost, then fire comes along with it. And the fire of God is unpredictable. It just consumes everything in our life until there is nothing left except room for the Holy Ghost and fire. And that's the wonder of it all. That's the miracle of it all. We love Acts. It's the beginning of the church. We love it because it tells us what happens in those moments. And we waddle ourselves after that. We say, if you want to be genuine, if you want to be true blue, then you've got to go back to the original blueprint of the church. And you've got to see what they did, and you've got to do what they do. You've got to act how they act. If we want to be a, a church that's relevant in this century, but connected to the power of God and the anointing of God, then we need to reach back with one hand and get a hold of what God spoke to us as truth. And we've got to get a hold of this generation. And somehow we've got to bring the two together. And we got to let the anointing of God happen in our lives, and we got to let the Spirit of God consume us and the fire of God. 
And fire, that's the thing that, that just messes us up a little bit. I've never had a fire. We've never had a fire. Thank God. Pray covering over our church family. Don't ever let it happen. Well, my wife tells about when, the, <clears throat> when she was just a child, how that their home caught on fire. They were in a church service, and someone came, got her dad, and and somehow in the process, she ended up with a member of the church family down at the place where their home was. And they watched as that was caught on fire and fire consumed it. And it was just, she said it was horrific. It was a memory that, that just, it was just everything that happened in that moment because it changes everything. A fire changes everything. As a matter of fact, her father's camp is now like a sawed-off version of their home because the part that didn't burn, he drug it up the lake on the ice, and that's what they've used for years and years. So you can still kind of see, I, I've been in the camp, and you look at the roof and the, the little plastic medallions that were there, they're just kind of, is it stalagmites? Icicles. Icicles would be nice right now, wouldn't it? This is what I see. <laughs> Just, why did he, why is he preaching about fire? <laughs> why tonight, God? <laughs> I'm in it with your team. <laughs> it's warm up here. Someone shift that fan this way. Brother P, you look very comfortable. So do you, Kathy. Just tease and don't worry about it. I'll sweat it out. <clears throat> but fire changes everything. Fire messes up your plans. It messes up your focus. Fire arrests what, you're, what you intend on, what you want to do. Fire just messes everything up in the natural. But there's something that happens in the supernatural. You see, fire has this huge benefit. If you really want purity, then the only way that you can get it, if you're talking about gold or metal, if you're talking about anything that works like that, you've got to let the fire in to do the work. There is no option. There is no other way. You've got to heat it up. Even thousands of years later, if you want to purify gold, do you know what you do? You heat it up. You've got to get it up. molten hot until the dross works its way to the top, and you push that impurity off to the, off to the side and, and you let what's pure and what's genuine come to the surface. Can I let us know tonight that God is trying to bring some purity in our lives and God is trying to bring some power in our lives, but it's going to take some heat. It's going to take some uncomfortable moments in the presence of God. It's going to take God doing a little bit of work that, that we don't really enjoy and we don't really appreciate in the moment, but that's the only way that God can bring purity in our lives. The Holy Ghost and fire. Terry there. Terry in Jerusalem. I, I want to interrupt your life. I want, to, I want to get you back on track, church, for what I have in store for you. We need a little more of that. The old songwriter said, wait for it, waiting on the Lord for the promise given, waiting on the Lord to send from heaven, waiting on the Lord by our faith receiving, waiting in the upper room. It's the power the power gives victory over sin and purity within. The power, the power, the power they had at Pentecost. It is worth waiting for. It is worth letting God heat us up and stir us up. It is worth it to let the Holy Ghost and fire in our lives because that's when we blossom and become the church that God wants us to be. It's worth waiting for. The Holy Ghost. It was referenced in Acts chapter 1 verse 4. It said, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Jesus said, Ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. The Holy Ghost baptizes us. In the same way that we baptized Sydney this morning, Pastor Matt, Pastor Mike were back there. There wasn't room for me. I was standing on the stairs, but I watched as she went down in that watery grave of baptism and rose to walk a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. She was buried in the name of Jesus. She was all consumed. The water kind of splashed over top of her as she went down in Jesus' name. And when she came back up out of that tank, we remarked and said, that's a brand new person. That's a brand new person right there. When, can I just tell you, when, when we're baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire, God just wants to consume our life. He wants the Holy Ghost and the fire just to sweep over the top of us and just, just bury us. 
bury us in purpose. That's why I, I love coming to the house of God. It's, you can't do this anywhere else. I was thinking as I was in my seat, I was thinking, where else can we do this any other time in the week? Unless you're an air traffic controller. presence of God and you just can overcome and say God bury me in your presence bury me in this power bury me in the Holy Ghost God just consume me come on sweep over my spirit sweep over my soul sweep over my life don't ever let me be the same in Jesus name Peter preaches I'll hurry through my notes I know it's warm the same Peter that I just denied him 53 days ago the same cursing Peter preaches the church into birth and Pentecost. Never to be the same again. And they emerged from the upper room, baptized, immersed with Holy Ghost and fire. There is nothing like the Spirit of God working in our lives. We can come back to the music tonight. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, the scripture speaks about David's anointing. It says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, David, in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Would you say that with me? From that day forward. You see, in our lives, when we were buried in Jesus' name and when we were filled with God's Spirit, God wants to work in our lives from that day forward. We'll never be the same. You enter into a covenant relationship with God. God fills you with his spirit. Never to be the same. The spirit was on David from that day forward. But there came a time in David's life when he was running for his life. And even though the spirit was on him, he still felt the need to go back to a place of anointing. You see, there is power in places through Scripture. You'll find that often people would go back to Bethel. They'll go back to places where God intervened, where God moved. As a matter of fact, he told them when they went through the Jordan, he said, build a memorial in Jordan and build a memorial on the other side of Jordan. Why? So that when you come back, to this place. There'll be a memorial that your kids will ask about and you can tell them about what God has done in your life. Memorials. Places are important in Scripture. There's power in your place of anointing. And it was a time later in David's life, not much later, as a matter of fact, by Scripture, it's only three chapters. When David interrupted everything to get back to the place of anointing in his life. You see, David had become popular with the people. Saul had lost the popular vote. Saul wanted David killed, so the Bible says David fled. That's let you know it's never fun fleeing. It's not like anybody says, man, we had a blast. We had to flee. So it's a bad time in David's life. So David fled. He's reaping the result of people making him a popular hero. Saul's killed his thousands. David's killed his ten thousands. And the scripture goes on. It says that he fled and escaped. We could say, well, David, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? It says he, he came to Samuel to Ramah. you got to... Get the picture with me. Why Ramah? It's in this area, this very region where David had been anointed initially, where God's presence, where God's spirit had came on David's life, never to be removed. But David had to come to the point where he said, God, I, I just got to go back for a fresh anointing. 
I got to go back for a fresh touch of your spirit. I, I got to go back. I, I could go many places. I could go to the caves. I, I could go to some friends. I, I could seek Jonathan out. I could try and work with him. But, but it says that David went back to Samuel. He went back to the person that kind of called him into this whole thing. And when you think about it, David had never asked for this. All David really wanted to do was worship God. All David wanted to do was tend sheep in the field and the pasture. And, and he had his own thing going with God. He, he loved God. He loved to write songs. He loved to worship God. He wanted to. But in this difficult time in his life, I'll tell you what David realized. What he needed most was David said, I've got to get back to a place of anointing in my life. i gotta, I got to go back to that reminder about God's power and God's presence. i I got to just kind of go back to the, the point where I remember that anointing oil running over. i, I got to get back in touch with Samuel and maybe his first question to Samuel was what did you get me into what'd you do to me I was happy where I was I didn't ask for this but I think somewhere underneath all of that was David saying Samuel I gotta pray this thing through Samuel, I just came back because I needed a reminder about what God's done in my life. I, I need a reminder about what God has in store for me in the future. And that's exactly what God is wanting to speak into somebody's life this evening. God's wanting someone to know. Pastor preached powerful this morning about standing firm. It's kind of the same lesson, same lines tonight. Some of you need to get back in a place of letting God anoint you. There's power in that anointing. It's unforgettable. It, it, it'll, it'll carry you through some difficult times when you get back in a place of anointing. You know, David, he really didn't ask for that. All of his brothers had lined up before Samuel. Samuel was there. Brandon, can I pick on you tonight? You're working this camera, aren't you? That's all right. Just, you want to operate the camera? His tie was free. I'm going to talk to him after about where he gets his ties. Two reasons. I need free ties, and I hope he didn't steal it. <laughs> I know he didn't. But David, he's out in the field. All the brothers have passed before Samuel. Samuel's like, not them, not them, not him, not him. Is anybody left? He says, yeah, there's one guy. Back in the field, you wouldn't, I don't think it's David. I don't think, I don't think he's the one. I don't, I don't think. And Samuel says, go get him. We'll wait. We'll wait right here. We're not, we're not going to do one thing until David gets him. So when David comes, the Spirit of God moves on Samuel. And Samuel said, he's the one. Now you look sharp tonight, but help me out here. So we do believe in democracy. Just a sec, I'm going to help him. Everybody was kung fu fighting. I don't know the rest of the song. That's all I know. Don't even know who sang it. If I offended you, I'm sorry. But David comes out of the field. Samuel anoints him. You see, unforgettable moments in God's presence. And when David came into difficult times in his life, 
there was something that he would never forget. You got to wonder, why did David run back to Ramah? I'll tell you why. Because that's where he was anointed by God initially. When he ran into difficult seasons in his life, he said, you know what? I'm going to go back to the place of anointing. I'm never going to forget what God did in my life. This pastor was preaching this morning. He's talking about skinny robe David. Fitz. He's talking about that. But I began to think, David's robe was no doubt stained with that oil of anointing that Samuel had poured over his head. Marked permanently. Do you know how, old it is, how hard it is to get oil out of clothes? You change the oil in the car and you're taking the drain plug out and the oil runs down and gets on your t-shirt, it gets on your sleeve. You know, you might as well just, you just goes in the rag bag. You can't get it out. Stain, it's there. In David's life, that oil of anointing marked him. And I think that later on in life, as he encountered maybe the moment where he was going to fight Goliath, he, he had the option of Saul's armor, like Pastor preached about, or he could have his soiled, anointed garment. I think what David said, I, I, I haven't proved that, but I have proved this. I have walked in this anointing. I, I have stepped out in this before, and God's came through. I, I watched as the lion was defeated. I watched as the bear was defeated. I know the power of this anointing. I don't know about that shield, that sword, but I tell you what, I'm going to walk in the power of that anointing. And I think that somewhere throughout David's life, there was a robe he didn't discard. There was a robe he didn't get rid of. Why? Because it represented an anointing in his life that that he always could refer to, that he always could go back to, that he always could point to and say, I'll never forget that day when God allowed me to be anointed. He called me into this. I didn't call me into this. He pulled me on his purpose plan. I didn't pull me on his purpose plan. God's anointing is on my life. Couldn't take David's life if you tried. Why? Because he'd been anointed by God. He'd been purposed by God. God had a plan. You, you tell me that David didn't walk with confidence. He did. Because he had been anointed. Church, the anointing is just typical of God's spirit in our life. And when we say, God, fill us with the Holy Ghost and with fire, what we're saying is let that anointing rest on us. Let that anointing dwell on us with fire. And we get in a difficult season and the enemy comes in like a flood. I tell you what we got to do. We're going to point back to the season where God anointed our lives. Unforgettable. Unforgettable seasons. But sometimes you just got to go back. You got to go for it with everything that you have. David could remember the worship experiences that he had on the field. He could have just stayed there. But look at what God did when he walked in the power of his anointing. Church, God is calling us to walk in the power of our anointing. God's calling us. He's summoning us. He's saying, come on, CCC. It's time to embrace what I have in store for you. It's time to step, in, step into that brand new level. It's time to step into that new place of authority. And it's only going to happen when we realize that God has anointed you and God has anointed me. I've been anointed by God. I've been called by God for this season. I've been called by God for this time. I have a purpose from God. warm but one more time could you just praise God for a moment I know it's getting a little bit heated in here but I just need someone to embrace the word of God somebody step over the discomfort zone into the comfort zone of the Holy Ghost come on it's right there come on it's just as real that bottle sitting on the platform there's a refreshing there's an anointing here for someone to receive in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus would you stand together with me in closing tonight asking us to find a personal place of anointing 
around the front of this altar tonight. Young people, I'm encouraging you to find a place of anointing tonight. Families, I'm encouraging us to find a place of God's anointing in our lives tonight. The same way that David didn't intend for it, he was going about his business. I think the Spirit of God is summoning someone in this room into a place of anointing tonight. Young people, I'm not stepping on Pastor Matt's toes. I'm not trying to overstep his ministry. But it concerns me and it worries me that when we have the whole world at our fingertips, you can know more than your pastors with the click of the button in Wikipedia. Knowledge is abounding, but we're only going to find God in a secret place of prayer. And anointing comes in moments like that where we separate ourselves to God. Are you going to have failures along the way? Yes. We all have. We've all failed. But it's in moments of questioning and concern that when we can reach back and we know that in a personal place, God has met us and God has anointed us, that we can hang on and we can walk through the dark seasons and we can walk through difficult valleys. And that may be specifically for our youth tonight, but I'm speaking to our church family as well. Families, it's times like that that we need to lean in on God's anointing, that we need to find that personal place and say, you know what? I remember a hot Sunday night in July when God met our family, where God's anointing rested on my life, and I'd never been the same since. God's Spirit has never left me since that service. God's anointing has never left me since that moment. encouraging us. Let's find a place of personal infilling. Let's find a place of personal power with God. Not because that's what we want, but that is what we need in this generation and in this day and in this age. And it's not time for autopilot in the summertime. It's time for us to knuckle down and get a hold of what God wants to do in us. David fled to that place of anointing in his life. David fled to the man of God in his life. We need to flee sometimes from sin so we can find a place of power. David had a few things that we can point to in scripture that he did wrong. There's, a, there's so many things that he did right and this was one of them. Difficult season, difficult time. What did he do? He fled. He fled to Ramah. I'm encouraging you tonight. Someone needs to get to Ramah tonight. Right here in the room, there's two kinds of people, maybe three. There are people that want to be here. Thank you for coming. But then there are people that need to be here tonight. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, I wanted to go. I, I like the music. I like the people. I have good friends and good history. Good preaching. Good singing. Good, 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 good. I was glad when they said there are some other people that no one had to say anything to you at all. You said to yourself, I have got to get to the house of God. I have got to get in the presence of God. I need something from God today. No option. I need it. 
and you're in this room tonight, you needed to be here. As a matter of fact, you're just waiting for me to finish so you can come to the altar. You see, you approach church different when you need to be there. When you need to be there, it changes everything. It, it changes how you come. It changes the way you're prepared for church. It, it changes what you were thinking about this afternoon. It, it changed where you sat. It changed who you sat with. It changed how you sang. It changed how you worship. Why? Because you needed to be here. You needed something from God tonight. I'm grateful for everybody that wants to be here. But there's some people in the room, this is your rhema tonight, and you need to be here. And God is here to meet you right where you are. Maybe you come in unexpectedly. Maybe you're the Kansas Labrador Retriever. You had no idea what you were getting yourself into, but when you came into God's presence, there was something powerful. I feel it right now. Sort of cold. God began to move. God began to speak. God began to touch. God began to minister. This, this is more than just singing and more than just someone in the speech tonight. This is God's presence interacting with people. What a miracle! What a miracle! And the invitations here. Oh, it's just a flower vase from the kitchen. God's anointing is here today. God's anointing is here the same way that that poured over Brandon's head down his robe. God's presence is that real in this place tonight for someone who's ready to receive. I'm closing. I'm sorry for taking your time tonight. It's, it's warm, it's hot. There's a challenge in the Holy Ghost though if you receive it. Father, thank you for every person in this room. God, we're going to begin to sing in a moment. Someone needs that Holy Ghost and fire working in their life tonight. God, consume us. Fill us. I thank you for every person that's giving and every person that's yielding. God, every person that's committed, given time, effort, energy, we thank you for them tonight. We got someone came and they have questions. They don't know why they're in the situation they're in right now. They don't know why. The struggle is real tonight. But we're turning to you, God. We know where to go. We're going to a place of anointing. So God, be true to your promise. Show up with power. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to come together. Ministry teams, ministry leaders, and my team members. Be ready to pray with people tonight because some people need anointing in their lives. If you need a touch of God's anointing, if you need God to break shackles, loose bondages, set you free, would you come? If you need God just to minister, questions that you have, maybe season saint, brand new alike. I wish we'd find our way to this altar because God's anointing is here to do something in somebody's life tonight. I'm down my soul that I can't